Well, welcome into Easter weekend. I know this is not how most of you would be spending it. You'd want to be going to church on Sunday morning, and, and I know I'm missing it too. I've been seeing where pastors are talking about they're kind of getting tired of this live streaming or recording their messages and putting them on the internet. They just want to be back with everybody, and I feel the same way, but you know what? I'm also thankful. I'm thankful that God has given us the technology that we at Bolivia Baptist and anybody else that's joining me on this uh, can just come together and worship. People all over the country can, can see me and I can see them and we can just see each other and we can enjoy uh, just worshiping the Lord together. You know, Bolivia Baptist on Easter Sunday morning, it's always a special morning. We, we don't have Sunday school. What we do is we have a big breakfast, and I always love that because I love to eat, but, but we have some excellent cooks, too, in our church. But we have a big breakfast followed by a message for the children and an egg hunt, and then we go into our worship service. And our worship service, it's usually just dynamic as far as its music and the passion of the people, uh, the choir. I, I know a lot of you are missing your choir uh, at Bolivia Baptist, and if you go to a different church, maybe you have a praise team or whatever, But and you're missing that aspect of worship, and I, and I get it, and, and I'm taking the guitar, and I'm trying to fill that void as much as I can, and uh, I know it's not always enough, but I, but I know I thank you for the encouragement that many have given me uh, for doing that, and at least making that attempt. And if, if you're a guest and you're just checking out, I know some people tune in, they go, okay, well, this isn't my cup of tea. If the music's not your cup of tea within the first little bit, I encourage you today to stick with it, though. Don't just check out, because today I've got a very unique message. As I finish my series, the main event, we get to the main event. So far, we've talked about the undercard, but we get to the main event, and it's always the best event. And so I hope you'll stick around for that, a very unique message about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, here on Easter weekend. So I just thank you for joining me. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin into the music. And Father, we come to you now, and we thank you for sending your one and only Son, Jesus, who died and rose again that we could be forgiven of our sins and have everlasting life. And Lord, I pray that as I prepare to do the music right now, that God, you would just guide my hands as I play, strengthen my voice as I sing, but most of all, that you just bless us. Bless us with these lyrics and what they mean and just a closeness with you. Wherever we might be in our living rooms or wherever we might be watching, may we draw near to those that are watching with us. If we're watching alone, may we just sense your presence very close to us. God, this is a special weekend, and just because we can't meet together in a church building doesn't change the fact that you, Lord Jesus, have risen. You are risen indeed, and we praise you for that, and we exalt you and magnify your holy name. So make yourself known through the music, through the preaching. Lord, I just pray all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start out with a very familiar hymn for most of you, and I hope that you uh, we'll sing along with it. I know it's a little awkward sometimes, but just sing out, especially those that, that don't feel comfortable singing in church because you don't feel like you have a very good voice. Well, guess what? You're at home. Sing as loud as you want and raise the roof of your home and really enjoy uh, worshiping the Lord today. So let's start with uh, Nothing But the Blood, all right? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, for my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No 
ever found, I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Well, I hope you enjoyed singing along with that one. Uh, the next one's not necessarily one that you're going to uh, know. Some of you may know it, some of you may not, and if you can sing it, that's fine. I'm kind of doing it more just because God just laid it on my heart, and it's a, a special, more of a contemporary type song, um, and it's it just speaks of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful, awesome event that is, an eternal event, and so if you don't know it and can't sing along, just listen to the words and just really uh, absorb those. I hope I could do this. Uh, it's a little out of my wheelhouse, but hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll come out all right. Okay. The moon and stars they wept. The morning sun was dead. The savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, His blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon Him. One final breath He gave, as heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high. Forever He is risen. He is alive. He is alive. Forever Forever He is lifted high, forever He is risen, He is alive, He is alive. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome, we sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. And 
He is alive. He is alive. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high. Forever He is risen. He is alive. He is alive. He is alive. Father God, we thank you that your son came and died on a cross for our sins, that he rose again, that we might have everlasting life, but that he is alive, not only in heaven sitting next to you, but he's alive in those who believe. That through your spirit, we have your resurrected life, Lord Jesus, living in us and through us. And so God, teach us that today. May we grow in you, may we grow closer to you, and may our relationship with you mean something more following this weekend as we celebrate Easter, that you might be glorified in us as you are glorified in heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, as you can see, we've changed environments. We've moved outside. Happy Easter to you on that. We've gotten out of the room and we've gone outside. We're down on the inland waterway at a friend's house at Carolina Beach doing it right here on their dock and we're so thankful for them allowing us to use this and to bring this Easter message to you today. Today's the conclusion of the series, the main event. We've had two undercard events, the Transfiguration, which revealed Jesus' divinity to the three disciples. We've had the Triumphal Entry, which revealed it pretty much to everyone as everyone was shouting, Hosanna, blesses he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now we approach the cross and find that people have to take sides. Now, I know that's not something we do in our culture today, right? We, we don't take sides. I mean, our political environment and all that, our families, nobody's ever taking sides at anything, right? Yeah, right. Well, in fact, things are so tough right now as far as people taking sides in our political environment that we're judged even if we say nothing and don't take a side. That's kind of our culture right now, but people are always just taking sides. That's the truth. And well, Christ really was no different. When he came, he told us that he, he didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. He came to separate people into believers and unbelievers. And while that was evident during his earthly ministry, it will be most evident during the Passion Week. As Jesus gets closer to the cross, some people will be disappointed, and we'll even see him as a failure. Some of them will change from shouting Hosanna to shouting crucify him. This is much like the boxers we've been talking about as we've been going through this series when they enter the arena for their fight. You know, some people cheer and some people boo but because they have chosen a side. In our main event, there are two combatants and they've been going at it quite a while. There's Jesus, who had always existed, but who entered the arena in last week's message with great fanfare. The people see him as their champion, their great warrior. Then there's Satan, who's technically been in the ring the whole time because the ring is this world And as Lucifer, he was cast down to it before time as we know it began. But for the sake of giving him a clear entrance onto the scene, we look at John 13. Take your Bibles to John 13, verses 26 through 27. We're in the upper room, and they're observing the Passover Jesus is with his disciples, and uh, they're eating and they're drinking as they're supposed to do, passing the bread and breaking the bread and passing it. And we have an interesting situation. Jesus says that one of them is going to betray him. And everybody starts saying, well, surely not I, Lord, is it I? And we get to verse 26 of John chapter 13. Uh, and it says this, Jesus then answered, this is, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Within a few days of a boxing match, like we've been talking about throughout this series, the fighters come together for what's called a weigh-in. To fight in a certain weight class, they must maintain a certain weight range. Each one steps up on the scale and weighs in. And once that's done, there's usually a photo op, you know, with the two fighters staring at each other. Well, here in the upper room, Jesus and Judas have a moment much like that. Satan enters into Judas when he eats the bread, and Jesus looks at Judas and basically says, bring it on. (laughs) Bring it on. So we know the two combatants. Jesus, who wants to free the world from sin and death, is in one corner. Diagonally across the ring is Satan, who wants to steal, kill, and destroy anything that is valuable to God. That's you. 
You are valuable to God. Satan is wanting to separate all of us from the presence of God and the knowledge of God so that we will not seek God. He knows if we seek God, we'll find him and discover that he, we have meaning and purpose and value. And Satan doesn't want that because he hates God and wants us to hate God as well. Now, the pre-fight scouting report says this, is our, this about our fighters. Jesus likes to use the weapons of the spirit. He fights on a spiritual plane. Satan uses the weapons of the flesh. Jesus wants to win the fight with love. Satan wants to win it by using temptations of the flesh to lead us to rebel against God. Understand, this fight started in heaven when Lucifer was cast down, and it began on earth in Genesis 3 when Satan successfully tempted Adam and Eve to doubt God's word. Sin came when man stopped believing God and started believing Satan. That's exactly what Eve did. She didn't believe God's word. Instead, she believed what the certain serpent said to her. So this fight has been long. It has been brutal. Many times in the Old Testament, Satan successfully led some of God's children into rebellion, and God had to discipline or even kill them in order to keep the rest from going astray. The wages of sin is death, the scriptures tell us, and God had to make examples of some in order to preserve others. Sounds cruel. But the problem originates from Satan and man's response to temptation, which for Israel was a breaking of their covenant with God. It's not God's will. It's never God's will for anyone to perish. But sin demands payment, and death is the debt we all owe. Satan, of course, uses all of this to convince people that God is unfair and even cruel. He wants us to believe that God's our enemy. But the truth is, we are our own enemy. We rebel against our Creator when we sin, and we deserve immediate punishment. But God most often shows patience, even letting us feel the pain of discipline of the flesh so that our spirits can be preserved. So this battle has raged since the beginning of time on earth. But the main event that we're going to look at today will occur on the Passover week in the 33rd year of the life of Jesus in his earthly form. And as we come to the main event, we'll see 10 rounds of intense battling with Jesus using his spiritual weapons of warfare and Satan coming at the physical body of Jesus. I guess you could say... Satan is more of a body puncher, whereas Jesus aims for the heart. For the sake of time, I'm going to summarize the first nine rounds, and then we're actually going to go ringside for round 10. Round 1, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Satan tempted him to forsake his mission to save the world. Jesus seemed staggered for a moment as he pleaded with his Father in heaven to let the cup of wrath pass. But ultimately, Jesus won the round by saying, Not my will but yours be done. Round two, Jesus is betrayed by Judas and arrested, so round two clearly goes to Satan. Round three, Jesus is punched in the mouth and face repeatedly. He offers no resistance in this round, which Satan wins handily. <clears throat> round four, Jesus is in front of the Roman official Pilate. Ultimately, Pilate finds no fault in Jesus, and so Jesus wins round four. Round five, it starts to turn ugly. The crowd turns on Jesus. Even some who had shouted in favor of him as he entered the ring begin to call for his death. They shout, crucify him, and it appears Jesus is going down early. Satan wins another round as Jesus is sentenced to die. Round six went to Satan as they beat Jesus, pulled out his beard, and put a crown of thorns on his head. Round seven also went to Satan as Jesus carried his cross through the streets of Jerusalem and was mocked. Round eight, Jesus was nailed to the cross by his hands and feet. He was in agony and Satan won round eight. Round nine, Jesus hung on the cross. He bled all over the ring. The crowd yelled out to him and challenged him to fight back, but Jesus did not and Satan won this round as well. We come to round 10, and Satan is ahead on all the worldly judges' scorecards by a count of seven rounds to two. Round 10 begins, and Jesus is barely able to stand. Satan looks untouched and seems totally in charge of the fight. Jesus can barely see through the blood that's running into his eyes. So let's go ringside for the announcing of what's left of this final round. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus looks weary. I don't think he can take much more of this. Wait, what's he doing? Jesus has dropped his hands. He's wide open, and he's saying something. 
He's giving up. He says, it is finished. Satan lands one last body blow and Jesus is down. The one called King, Messiah, Lord, Son of God is down for the count. This might be all over, folks. Well, that's how it might have sounded. Well, because that's what happened. You see, John 3.16 tells us God so loved the world that he gave. He gave what? His only begotten Son. That's Jesus. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus laid down his life so that yours could be preserved. Oswald Chambers says this in his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. The cross did not happen to Jesus. He came on purpose for it. Because of God's love, Jesus willingly laid down his glory in heaven, came to earth and took on human form, showed us the love of God through his ministry, and then laid down his life so that we could go free. He let Satan kill him so that Satan could not kill those who accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. Jesus took our beating, endured our shame, and paid our price. And the scriptures bear witnesses. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He, God the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, he was sinless, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The apostle Peter in 1 Peter 2.24 says it even more plainly, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That's the purpose, to make us right with God. For by his wounds you were healed. You see, the only way to a right relationship with God is through the blood of Jesus. His shed blood was the penalty for our sin, and he took it because of his great love for us. Right now, you're in a battle. You may not know it, but you are. Satan wants you to never know God. He puts all kinds of appealing worldly people and things in your life, turning life maybe even to a great party, just to keep you from seeing Jesus and realizing that when all of this comes to an end, all that will matter is if you said yes or no to the salvation he offers. It won't matter if you were successful in this world or enjoyed the things of this world. All that will matter is if Jesus is your Savior and Lord of your life. Satan doesn't want you to know that. Satan wants you to think you can save yourself. But what Jesus went through on the cross proves that God knows you cannot save yourself. So he gave his only son, that which was most precious to him, in order to save you. Without Christ, you are automatically in Satan's corner and you are losing the fight you think you are winning. Our problem as human beings is not Satan. It's really sin. That's what keeps punching our lights out. The desires of the flesh and the temptation to go our own way without God. Sin is our enemy, but Jesus had to let his enemy, Satan, collect our debt from him so that we could be forgiven. Hebrews 9.22 says, All things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. We need forgiveness. And that's why we need the shed blood of Jesus. But there's still one more problem. Jesus is God, and Jesus is dead on the canvas in the ring. How do we get to heaven? How do we receive eternal life if he is dead? Well, do you remember what I just said just a few moments ago? I said, you are losing the fight. You think you are winning. The same was true of Satan. He thought he had Jesus defeated. He was dead and it was over. After all, Jesus said it is finished and gave up, right? But you see, when Jesus said it is finished, he meant that his blood had been shed for your forgiveness. That part was completed. But there was still more to come. For us to have victory over death and the grave, death could not be the end for Jesus. So returning ringside, we hear the referee counting. As Jesus lays dead on the canvas, he counts one day, two days, three days, and on the count of three days, breath returned to the dead corpse. His eyes opened. Jesus got off the canvas. The crowd was shocked. Jesus, Satan was stunned. He thought he had won, but all along he'd been losing as Jesus carried out his mission to rescue lost sinners and make a way for them to live in heaven for all of eternity. Jesus got off the canvas and by his resurrection delivered the knockout blow. Satan is defeated forever. Sin is forgiven. Death is overcome. All of this is in John 20, 1 through 16. Turn, with that, turn to that with me just for a moment and let me just read it from the scriptures. John 20, 1 through 16, which says this. 
Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple, who had first come to the tomb, then also entered, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb, weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said that, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. I did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. What an amazing moment I, to, to think. Mary had to have chills in that moment. It almost gives you chills just hearing it. You see, the crucifixion and death of Jesus allowed us to be forgiven of our sin and have a relationship with God. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead makes that relationship an eternal one, opens the gates of heaven to all who will believe in him. If Jesus had stayed dead, his death would have meant nothing more than all the lambs offered by the Hebrew people on the altar. Remember the Old Testament? How they would offer one annually for the atonement of the entire group of people, the entire Hebrew people? They had to do that every year or their sins weren't covered. But Jesus' resurrection means we've been atoned for once and for all. Even though we may still sin, sin is not our master and we don't have to be its slave. Even though our bodies may die, the grave has no hold on us because Jesus rose and one day we will rise and take our place in heaven if we give ourselves to him now. In Christ and the victory he has won, we who believe in him find victory. In his resurrected life, we find eternal life. You don't have to turn to it, but in Romans chapter 3, let me just read verses 23 through 25. Verses 23 through 25 says this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in, guess who? Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly. Well, when did He do that? We've just been talking about it right on the cross. As a propitiation or a settlement or a payment or a satisfaction, a propitiation in His blood through faith. That was This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. That's what he has done. Now, what do you need to do? Well, it's not really hard. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a simple process. Some have a hard time with it because confessing Jesus is Lord means giving up control of your life and following him. Your desires giving way to his desires. It means yielding your allegiance to him. Theologian and author C.S. Lewis once wrote, we do not come to God as bad people trying to become good people. We come to God as rebels to lay down our arms. All too often we come to God and just try to be better. What we have to really do is stop fighting against him and lay down our lives and take up our cross and follow him. Salvation is not your work. It's his work done on the cross. He's done the hardest part. Will you yield to him? Will you lay yourself down and let him become your everything? Will you look at your life and say, it is finished, and let his life in you begin? When the fight began, if you weren't on Jesus' side, you were automatically in Satan's corner. There is no neutral. Jesus is giving you the opportunity to change sides. In him is life and love and joy and peace. 
not a perfect everything always goes all right, but a life in him that is eternal. If you want to invite Jesus into your heart right now, will you pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I believe Jesus is your son and that he died on the cross to bring me forgiveness and that he rose from the dead that I might have everlasting life. I know that I'm a sinner and I confess that I'm a sinner and I invite Jesus into my heart. Save me from my sin and make me your child. Fill me with your spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now for those viewing who are already born again believers in Jesus who just prayed that prayer, let me make one last point. Satan is lost. If you're in Christ, then through him you have victory. Satan will still try to fight, but he is fighting like a loser. You know how a loser fights? He fights dirty. He'll try to hit you when you aren't looking, or he'll hit you when you're down. But I've got good news for you. You don't even have to pay attention to him. That's right. Don't give him the time of day. You know, I see and hear Christians talking about praying against Satan. I don't really see that in the scripture other than the casting out of demons. Yes, we are in a spiritual war. But what I see over and over again in God's word is a calling into his presence, the call to abide in Jesus and dwell with him. James tells us that we're to humble ourselves, resist the devil, and draw near to God. So if we humbly draw near to God, the devil has no chance. If we remain close to Jesus, Satan can't touch us. He can tempt us to leave Jesus behind and do our own thing. But all we have to do is cry out to Jesus and remain in him. We don't have to put Satan in his place. Jesus already did that. Satan fights from a position of defeat. In Christ, you are in a position of victory. Claim Christ's victory when tempted and walk away from Satan. Don't let him pick a fight with you. He's powerless. The real power is the Holy Spirit in you. So walk in victory because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, thanks for joining me for this. Sorry about the little snafu with the movement, but the wind down here, it's worth it for the background. Amen? Uh, hey, coming up this week, midweek with Mike, as Mike Dixon continues his midweek uh, lessons, as he talks about the cross and the meaning of the cross and the background of the cross. And then next week, it's my intention to preach a message entitled Cast Away, and it's about loneliness. I hope that we will be back together soon. But in the meantime, I hope that you'll take care of yourself, call each other, stay in touch, and help your neighbor. Now, what I want to do, wish you a happy Easter. Some of you from Bolivia Baptist have been missing this group, and some of you don't know this group, so I'm going to call in my family for just a moment. I'm going to back up so my family will just kind of come on in here and squeeze in here with me. You're going to have to come right in front of me here. There you go. You're going to have to get in here. This is Natalie, my wife. Alex, my son, one of my sons. My other one doesn't live with us, so he's not here with us today. And one Lee, our daughter. And we all just want to wish you a very happy Easter. Easter.